You know, I'm really excited to speak to Eric. Eric has done something in the background which is truly extraordinary. He's really catapulted forward the usability of Metaverse and created a platform for Metaverse experiences for brands and all sorts of other options. So we've seen a lot of Metaverse experiences coming from the ground up, things like Decentraland. But here we're seeing something at scale with incredible functionality that's already being used by hundreds of thousands of people for various events. He's integrated all of the concepts of Web3, and it's also an open system so people can build on top of it, and nobody really knows about it. So I'm really excited to show you what the hell is going on here at Vatten. Eric, good to see you, my friend. Great to see you, Ralph. Very good. There's a lot to dig into, and I think this is going to take a lot of people by surprise, so I'm really looking forward to this. <laughs> Before we start, give us a bit of your background, and then why you've got into this kind of crazy crypto metaverse hybrid as well. So let's start at the beginning. Yeah. Who's Eric? Where did he, how did he get here? Well, the beginning is really quite a while ago, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the beginning is, well, this is my, the company that we're building now is my 16th. So the beginning starts way back, uh, really in high school where I was fascinated with the idea of being able to create a project uh, collaboratively and to see it come into the world and start to make an impact. And uh, as time rolled on, I started to build companies in Los Angeles. Started really with a background in English and American literature, computer science and animation, looking for ways to bring story and narrative and humanity together with technology as communication medium, and really started with some interesting things in music videos and then CD-ROMs. And then one day, my brother, Greg, who's working with us today, came to me and said, you got to check out this project from this kid at uh, University of Illinois who put a, a browser together to look at the hypertext layer on the internet. So Tim Berners-Lee had been doing some wildly interesting work in that uh, regard. And suddenly there was this thing called Mosaic. And it took somewhere, I don't recall if it was half a second or three seconds, but it was somewhere in that range for me to go, oh, <laughs> this is something. <clears throat> Veer left. Like this has significant implications. Suddenly you can have devices that are not compatible with one another, but are playing this browser uh, that could communicate with one another and distribute information and also become ultimately publishing tools for the world's information to start to get organized and linked to, to each other. It was mind boggling how it would affect everything. And it was evident so quickly. Um, however, there were a lot of kinks to work out of the system. Uh, at the time, we even had to get people to agree on TCP IP. There was folks at Microsoft trying to do Microsoft TCP IP and, you know, competing standards <clears throat> where the browser is not being compatible with one another. So the promise was different than the reality, but it was very clearly moving at breakneck speed. So uh, long story short, with my trajectory against this, it was really going out to try to convince the world that this was highly significant. Uh, people at the time running the world's largest companies, governments, organizations of all types. There were some that were interested in experimenting, but many said, why would I want a website? Why would I want something that downloads? So were you working with Mosaic this time? Uh, yeah. I was not at all. I was right. simply adopting it. And, right. uh, and then it quickly became Netscape when I was working with them. Uh, and then with Microsoft, who decided to try to kill them, I'm embarrassed to say. But, um, but you know, th those were times when the antitrust rules were um, not yet formed, <laughs> I guess you might say, around this space. Um, but we were working with a number of the different players that were in that sector. But before long, what happened was people stopped questioning whether they should have a website. And they really wanted to know, how do we apply it better? How do we get a better one? How do we get a more powerful one? How do we use it for communication across all sectors, healthcare, education, government, um, and advertising and marketing? And nothing would really quite be the same. And this internet sector went from something that was uh, an interesting thing to dabble with, even a distinguishing factor, to just a fact of life. And my trajectory has been, ever since, 
looking at what are the next convergence of trends that would then advance this marvel to the next phase that could affect every part of our lives. And what were those 16 businesses doing just before we get on to Vatim and how you got into this? But uh, what, what, what the hell were these 16 businesses in all of this? And oh, there's so many uh, things, uh, starting with looking at how to affect, um, back in the early days, how, how to apply it to music and early VR. Really, there was the, these three pipe Onyx machines that had that, that literally the technology we were using had to be approved by the U.S. government to leave the country. But that same technology is far less powerful than what everyone is carrying around today in their pocket on their phone. So, you know, Moore's Law has really advanced, but the, each of the, of the companies focused on how we can essentially create more effective ways to develop these technologies and more effective ways to consume them. So when we started, it was really about industrial strength uh, web infrastructure and applications. So we built, for instance, the first um, online grocery store system that tied into inventory and was able to express that visually across devices uh, all the way through the payments. Uh, we built large banking systems. We built systems that we started to recognize these monolithic infrastructures that would break up the um, the code into Lego pieces so you can reuse them better. So this whole API revolution came about. We started a company called SOA Software, Service-Oriented Architecture, which was focused on a new way to organize code into services, which is really how code is done today. In fact, I wrote a book on the topic, and if you're ever having trouble with insomnia, I can recommend it for you. It's, it's incredibly effective. If you're one of the people that I would recommend it. Um, <laughs> works really nicely. Uh, so that book is out there called Understanding um, uh, Enterprise SOA with Hugh Taylor. And um, and then that led to the idea, well, if you can create services that are enabled on networks and you can assemble them like Lego pieces, well, why wouldn't everything become a service? And you'd move to things like your computer being a service. So I built a company called Desktone that ultimately was sold to VMware and is their product today. And each of these different elements became opportunities for companies. And you didn't have to be that visionary or smart. Sometimes I'd get credit for that where it wasn't due. Sometimes it was because it's my brother's idea. Sometimes because I'd be sitting down with a CIO for, for uh, lunch and I'd have all the CIOs on speed dial, you know, as everybody was avidly transforming their, their enterprise. And I'd ask him, what are you facing? And you see a consistency among groups uh, of CIOs in various industries. And then you could ask them, well, if I were to build that, would you buy it, right? There you go. There's a company. And uh, you can gain the knowledge of the people who really understand what they're doing in the verticals and then take that back to a set of experienced technologists and uh, folks who can uh, codify that into actual products. And so o over time, I, I feel like we were able to play a role in the, the I would say, the evolution of the Internet to be increasingly effective for businesses across sectors. And so it was really fun after a while to be able to go to pretty much any company in the world and look around and ask them, how are they running? And say, oh yeah, we, we, we worked on that, we worked on that, we worked on that. But it was never anything my mom could understand. You know, it was never anything that, that you could say like, oh, cool. Like, and, and, and it was awesome and I can't complain, but it's interesting because as time evolved, I remember distinctly where I was when Google was born. Um, and it wasn't hanging out with Larry and Sergey. It was, it was, I was working with AltaVista and Excite and Yahoo. And then suddenly Google exploded, right? And when, when Facebook came around and Mark Zuckerberg was building some really interesting things, I was more focused on the, the brilliant and, and amazing people building MySpace. But it was really Facebook that, that took the helm on the consumer side and became kind of a, a, a fact of life. And each of these things that um, erupted that way uh, was interesting to watch, but we were really building the plumbing in a lot of ways that, that a lot of these organizations were using. Uh, Service-oriented architecture led to um, the advent of cloud computing. Uh, we were the first people that kind of coined the phrase hybrid cloud to denote organizations that would have part of their infrastructure internal versus external, and then how to bridge those to create uh, policy and security across them. So each of these things were kind of under the hood until now. So you'd ask, well, 
isn't 15 enough? Why, why do another one? I ask myself that frequently. Uh, well, th this, I think, is our first opportunity since the 90s to be part of something so transformative and important to daily life that uh, I think it's worth bringing the band back together and being part of it. So let's start with the blockchain side of it. When did you start becoming aware of that and the power of that? What, because you've been seeing, I mean, you're, the, the clear story is you've always been looking at the developments of the internet, where it's going, and you jump in when you see the opportunity of, okay, this is a new area. Yeah. Blockchain, when, when did it hear, hit in your radar screen? What's your story there? So it hit in my radar screen extremely early. But I can't say that I was one of the true pioneers of the early blockchain um, movement. Um, I read uh, the Satoshi White Paper um, very early on. I think it was probably less than six months after it was kind of fell from the heavens <laughs> from whoever wrote it. <laughs> and I was astounded by its beauty uh, and the implications of what it could be. Uh, folks out there that started evangelizing uh, blockchain were doing very interesting things. Folks like Brock Pierce and others that were out telling everyone to get Bitcoin. I really wasn't in that um, in that realm. I was really still focused on the plumbing, on the enterprise use cases, on how it would affect different businesses. Not from a speculative point of view. Not from like if I bought now, would I get more later or what what its use would be really as money, but what were the implications of this blockchain technology to society, to business? And I started to evangelize that to some degree within uh, the enterprise in, I would say about 2013, 2012, a little bit, 2013 in earnest. Um, by the time we got to uh, 2014, I was getting frustrated by what I felt was a, a mismatch between the rhetoric of the blockchain of advocates and the reality of the adoption curve of both the regulatory frameworks and the enterprise uh, pilots that were under uh, getting underway, it seemed to me two things. One, that blockchain was being prescribed as a um, prescription to all ills, and it simply isn't. It, it fits somewhere very nicely, I believe. It's a very powerful solution, I believe, today, but it fits in a, in a solution that, that needs to have a reason to be and that blockchain should be applied to it. And it was being applied in places that were not appropriate. And secondly, a lot of the beauty of the decentralized model was for the middlemen to, to, to not exist in certain you know, constructs of its application. And yet the folks that I were working on were trying to bring it in and almost um, in a backward style, uh, undermining the, the, the very premise of what some of the uh, technologies were meant to, to, to be uh, by centralizing certain aspects. I, I believe today that that's actually appropriate for many use cases where you want centralized pieces and you want decentralized pieces. Uh, at the time, as I was looking at it, uh, I just felt like this was going to go too slow for my liking. And I wanted to do something that I felt could be more significant if I was going to do something was like the next um, iteration of where technology was going. And I was sitting at my bar. I have a uh, bar uh, in um, uh, Santa Monica, which uh, I'd love to bring you to. It's really the coolest place. It's It's been there since 1931. Wow. I've owned half for about um, 15 years. And it's it has live music every night. And it's just a beautiful place with, with amazing, soulful people and performers. And I was sitting there just thinking about it and uh, having a beer. And it, it occurred to me that I really should step away from the complexity of the blockchain applications that I was looking at. Uh, credit, credit derivative swaps, moving title from place to place. Uh, all these things that needed a massive uh, merger of regulatory shifts, mindset shifts, enterprise reorganization psychologically, and just say, well, wait a minute, what if I could just put a beer on the blockchain? What if, at the time, there was no such thing as a non-fungible token, right? All Every token was the same. You couldn't distinguish one Bitcoin from another, uh, other than maybe the time it was born, uh, and you can trace its provenance. But they were all the same, like gold is all the same. Uh, but what if they weren't all the same? 
What if you could actually have something that was analogous to real world objects, to physical objects, but the, uh, the digital aspect of them would be on one side, but the authenticity and the uniqueness uh, and, and the ability to trace that provenance could all take advantage of this blockchain technology. And so the thought was, if I could have a beer and I could give it to you, and I wouldn't have it anymore, and that could be independently verified, and you could put it on the table, and someone else, you wouldn't have it anymore. Someone else could see it in augmented reality and pick it up themselves, give it to the bartender and get a real beer, transferring those, those, uh, those uh, bits to atoms, you would have a completely new uh, way of looking at so many different aspects of society. You, you'd have better ticketing. You'd have better engagement modalities because these objects are uh, gamified and they could be, uh, they, they could be network aware and change state. Uh, you'd have better couponing. You'd have better ways of uh, creating channels of, of marketing and advertising and ways of then obviously moving things like art from one place to another. Baseball cards and different types of artistic um, uh, creative output could then be tokenized and moved around for all sorts of purposes, both commerce and creativity. And so it was, it was kind of like very clear that this was... As clear it was to me when the blockchain first came around, it's clear to me like this would be super cool uh, to focus on. And so I started a company called Batom, which stands for Virtual Atom. The idea being one that when I started to go around and talk to folks about this concept, the idea of a non-fungible token was a mouthful. And everyone said nobody will ever. When was this? When did you start this? So this was early 2015. Oh, okay. So early. I, yeah. So I put forward this uh, set of, I would guess, uh, propositions, concepts, uh, white, paper, well, even formal white papers, decks, uh, and then looked to find folks uh, that could help implement. But that's when I uh, came across uh, Craig Sellers and some other folks who uh, Craig at the time had been the CTO of Tether and had worked on something called OmniLayer, which was really a very interesting technology that was able to start to realize some of the benefits. Anyway, we assembled some early believers. I was able to hire them into an entity that uh, we began with a, a single-minded vision, which is the creation of experiential non-fungible tokens for the next generation of human engagement. <clears throat> Whereas you started, uh, if you look at the evolution of the internet or of the internet and the web and, uh, and uh, subsequently apps, you, you find that each innovation made it more and more interesting to, um, to brands, to companies, to governments, to communicate with their constituents, right? And to gain data from that and to be more present and, and more effective. What was clear here is that if we could simulate all the elements of a physical object in a digital object, this would be as significant as any innovation before it for the internet. Uh, what was missing from the early uh, proposition, which then came, I, I think, several months later, in, in maybe late 2015, early 2016, was each of the elements that needed to come together to make this uh, perfectly effective. The things that you can represent as objects needed to then have the people to use them and needed to have the place to, uh, to experience them. So this idea of people, places, and things on the internet then became my rallying cry, my belief system ever since. And that's what Vadim is seeking to do today. I mean, you were incredibly early to understand what NFTs were. I mean, we didn't even have smart contracts at that point. That's right. So you didn't really have the technology available. You talk about AR, but that wasn't available. So, you know, it's very high concept phase. So when does the metaverse suddenly start clicking and you see that these whole worlds are about to come together? Because that's yeah. what you've done here. And we'll talk a, a, a lot more de depth about what you're doing. But how did you get to that sudden realization that, oh, my God, this is the time, the place, and it's all here? Yeah, it's interesting. The, this idea of the metaverse was always fascinating to me ever since I was in um, grade school. Um, I used to write games. I remember spending long hours with my father who's 
an expert at many things, including computer science and thinking about those text-based adventure games where you could say, okay, walk forward and we'll go right. You know, uh, I was like the dungeon master of my community. <laughs> you can tell where I was hanging out. <laughs> it wasn't that, <laughs> but not with the quarterbacks. Um, <laughs> so looking at this notion of creating a, a, a meta plane of reality was always something fascinating to me. But this was really quite different. This wasn't, this wasn't, well, I had that fascination. What my real interest here was, how do we enhance the world we live in today, the physical plane of reality that we've convinced our brain somehow is real? Um, how do we take that illusion and build on it to create a, a better experience in it, as opposed to how do we create a, a Ready Player One style you know, world that we can escape into and leave this one behind? And that's where this notion of a meta plane, a, a persistent set of qualities that our brain can perceive as real, started to evolve, starting with the notion of identity. So the first thing that I did was I put money into a, um, an open source project around self-sovereign blockchain-based identity. That is something that I think is fundamentally core to the entire premise, because you have to be somebody in this digital frame uh, in order to execute effectively your, your experiences and, and your commerce and your relationships with brands and people. So having that identity is key and owning your own data is a fundamental shift in how that next generation of uh, the internet will work and should work. So we started there. Then the idea is if you're somebody, you can own something. So then what is it that you own? And what is the idea of, what does it mean to own something? So the, the it's not really, ultimately it needs to be a legal construct, but that's not where I started with it. It was really much more a psychological construct. What does it mean to own something? What does it mean to feel like, like something's real? And the, the, to, to answer your question, like what clicked was really understanding that the way we understand something is real is not that uh, sophisticated. <laughs> it's you know, like, this is why magicians and illusionists can trick you every time. You're like, what? How did a rabbit? I, I don't get it. And, but, but you're like, I know it's not real, but I'm going to suspend disbelief. Good enough, right? And that's what happens with the real world around us. Like, we perceive like right now that I've got a computer in front of me, I've got a table, I perceive these things as real for a number of reasons. One of which is if I turn my head around and I come back, it's still there. So there's a notion of persistence. If that persistence wasn't there, I'd be totally shocked to be like, okay, maybe I'm dreaming. Maybe this is some illusion. Okay, there's a persistence. If I turn around without looking back and ask you if you see it and you say, yeah, I see the same thing generally, then there's another clue. Okay, we're in a shared reality. Then there's a notion of authenticity. Is there an independent observer that if we were both to go away, I have a belief, right or wrongly, that this would still be here. That really is very comforting to people for a lot of reasons. Um, it might not be true, because there's no real way to, to test that, but it's very comforting. So you, need, you really need an independent observer, rightly or wrongly, in, in your mind, psychologically, to say that this is actually uh, authentic, this is really real, and you can check with that to, to, to give you that comfort. That's where the blockchain comes in. It becomes that higher power. And um, <clears throat> the truth is, once you establish that psychologically, that it's a higher power, people forget to check whether the blockchain is real. It's the decentralization of the blockchain that actually gives it that power. Because if the government goes down or if the company goes down or if the original creator is no longer there, presumably the blockchain persists because of its mass decentralization and its ability to withstand all sorts of attacks and, and calamities and business uh, you know, and government uh, vagaries. So the, this, this notion of having all these qualities, check, 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 and now blockchain made me say, oh, blockchain's that missing link to go from an in-game virtual good, which has been around forever, to something that we can psychologically agree is real, has real ownership, and is independent of any game. And that's when I decided to get rid of the games, because I had been a gamer, I had been a, a big proponent of, of games, and, and, and gamify the world, right? The world becomes the game once you open it up into NFTs. But then the question is, how do you play with it? If you have a wallet and you have an NFT, what does it do? And that's where this notion of metaverse really 
started to evolve in my mind as we hit like the 2016 realm of R&D and exploration, because the objects themselves um, are the game. So this is 2016 you're having these thoughts? Yeah. Well, I was actually implementing. Yeah. Jesus. Okay. I can't yeah. get ahead around that, but carry yeah. on. We were in the team at, 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 at Vatim at the time. Um, we called it Potomac, and now we call it Vatim. And so the, the idea of creating these Vatims, uh, which were the earliest NFTs, was not, wow, I hope that we can find a greater fool than us to buy it and get it off our hands before somebody else you know, gets left holding the bag. We did understand that with any new technology, uh, gambling and such things tend to be the first uh, opportunity. And people say, oh, get rich quick schemes and all these you know, come in. But we started right from the premise that that would be short lived and that it would always be part of it, but it would go from maybe 95% of the focus to 5%, where 95% really is about engagement for healthcare, education, government, marketing, advertising, uh, coupons, tickets, like real utility, real engagement modalities. And that's where we started, right? And that's the focus even today. And so as you move to the notion of metaverse, we start with this idea of a, of a person, right? This identity. And so you were really mirroring how the brain perceives this plane of reality. Everything you look around and see is a person, place, or a thing. But when you go to the internet, it's not a person, place, or thing. It's a hunk of information that you can kind of wade through. It doesn't feel real. It feels useful. Um, sometimes, sometimes a waste of time, but it's very often useful. Um, but if you're, if, if you're in the real world, useful or not, it's there. And, you, and, and the brain has evolved to have experiences and memories and relationships in the context of the real world. That's our biology. And so as you translate that into this extension of the real world, not replacement, but extension into the, into the virtual plane, you now start to uh, recreate these primitives in a way that our brain absorbs naturally. So identity, moving into that space controlled by me. I could represent myself any way I want with avatars or just with video and my, and my data is my own. Then ownership, which are the objects. Now, the objects now have to be used, have to be interacted with. So the way that you do that is you can interact with that in your wallet, which is essentially a manifestation of your identity, or across the meta plane uh, that extends on this physical plane, right? Across augmented reality, or you might call it extended reality, because unlike augmented reality kind of uh, gimmicks where you hold up your phone and Captain Crunch waves at you and says hello, that's everyone has a siloed experience. That's a game. But if there's only one, and it's uniquely independently verified by a third party that you trust. And if I pick it up, it's no longer there. That is a real object, right? So if that starts to manifest in augmented reality, it's no less real than something made out of atoms. So atoms, by our, so let's say our, our vision and our goal is to, is to convince the world that they're no less real, right? So they can retain that value psychologically. And then you can interact with them in augmented space and then virtual spaces. And on the virtual space, the concept was and remains that the model that was so beautiful that got us into this in the first place is not over. In fact, it's just getting going. And that's the model of the web. Uh, there are billions of websites of every way, shape, and form. But now those websites on an information topology, what if they now could manifest to the next layer of human interaction? with people, places, and things. What if I could show up as myself and I could bring my stuff and I could drop it on a website and someone else could pick it up or I could find something in the website. And then the idea of the website being a place, we, it, it's not really a place today. You don't say, hey mom, meet me at cars.com and let's go check out cars. Go, what do you mean meet me? At, it's, it's information about cars. It's not a place to go. Well, yes, it will be, right? That's the meta plane we're layering on top of this internet. So it's a natural evolution. And so there's so many technologies that converge to bring this together. Ours being an amalgam of, uh, you know, on the shoulders of giants of many other technologies, um, some of which we've written and, and have pioneered and some of which we're assembling from genius uh, collaborators and people who have come before us in many areas, artificial intelligence, uh, augmented reality technologies, uh, amazing uh, um, devices, the virtual technologies, uh, WebGL. You know, these are not all decentralized technologies. These are technologies. <laughs> Centralized or decentralized is irrelevant. Where you want the decentralization, you should now apply it. 
So when we talk about the evolution of web from web one static, web two dynamic and interactive and UGC and, and all of these capabilities that came in that realm, e-commerce to, to, uh, to social media, we now go to the next generation, which is adding people, places and things. It's, it's really, really more fully integrating our digital and physical lives. And that was the revelation, is that we could bring these elements together now and be part of something much bigger than ourselves but also make an impact in it, which makes it worth doing and fun. And then I'm going to cut into the story here. So I got introduced to you by uh, a mutual friend, Anita Sands. Mm. And he said, oh, you should meet this guy, Eric, and look at Vatum. And I looked at the website. It was previous. It was before you just redone the website. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I have no idea. It looks pretty, crap. <laughs> but it looked pretty crappy to me. Anyway, I said, I'll, I'll take the call. And then... Um, I met you and you walked me through what you built. And it was like a holy shit moment to me because I've been on top of this metaverse stuff for quite a while. And I've seen what people are building. Yes, we know what Epic Games is doing, but we were looking at more of this kind of decentralized version of, of what a metaverse could be in a usable format. And I'd seen that on cyber had started using the browser rendering. Yeah. And I thought, okay, these guys are probably leading. And then I bumped into you and you unveiled all of the stuff you've already done and the mm. people you're working with. And it, it really blew my mind. And we will show some of the B-roll as we talk through some of what, what you've built. But the depth of what you've done already and the experience itself, which will always be improving because as technology improves, is, I think, simply staggering. So talk through what you've built because people need to get their heads around this because yeah. it's uh, honestly, when people watch this, they'll go, I had no idea, which is what I said to you is people don't know what you've done. Yeah. And hopefully they will. Thanks to you. And thanks to us now being ready. Right. We, we th there's a lot of R and D and experimentation that has to go into something comprehensive. <clears throat> We're not building a point solution. We're not building <laughs> A, a, a digital wallet that stands alone that lets you buy and save, sell trip crypto. It's not interesting to us. We're not building a meeting solution so you can go into the web and run around with your little avatars and run into you. We're not just building NFTs so you can create a thousand aliens and try to, you know, drop them and hope that people will buy more than, you know, than, than they cost you and, they, and all of that. What we're doing is we're recognizing that there's a convergence of phenomena that if we were to create an underlying platform that each of these elements that allows you to create these various kind of point solutions or, or, or simple use cases, if each of those worked seamlessly together, then you would have the ability to build what we think is the next generation of the internet, right? Each of these things individually, um, what you find is they can appeal to an interesting niche and they can appeal to the imagination which is what happened in the early stages of this hype around metaverse, around NFTs and, and the like. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, this could be incredible. Let's throw a huge amount of money in and I'm sure it'll come back very quickly. Well, that's not really how these things work. What happens generally is you have to experiment. You have to learn what are the actual uh, practical use cases in the various verticals that makes this better than a website, a standard website. What makes it better than a standard app? We're on you know, a Zoom equivalent here, whatever this application is. It's pretty good. Um, why would I want to um, undermine the simplicity and, and power of this addition of people on top of the internet to communicate by adding a needless complexity or gimmicks, right? You have to really look at what's the power and the substance that this really brings to, to business in a way that is measurable and matters. And the answer, to us came from the integration of these various pieces together. Any one of which, if it was left out, doesn't create a, a, a product. So for us, it, it, was, it, it took time. And that's, that's uh, what brought us here. But we had to make, for instance, we had to make a wallet that was MetaMask-like in that it's your data, it's your wallet. It's not an individual brand or company's. Uh, and you have the ability to hold NFTs, what we call VATOMs, um, but the NFTs have to be dynamic and smart. And the ability to use it had to be mass market. 
Right now, if you build a metaverse and say, plug in your MetaMask, you lose 95% of your audience, at least the audience that we care about, which is the audience of, you know, of, of Pepsi, the audience of Procter & Gamble, the audience of Verizon. The, the, the general audience out there um, will, in small measure, increase the amount of users of MetaMask from 30 million to 60 million, et cetera. But we, we're looking for the multi-billion uh, community of the internet today that's now become familiar and incorporated that into their lives. How do we make this as simple as scanning a QR code or clicking a link and now you're in? And then what do you do with those objects? The simplicity of a JPEG is interesting if you want to uh, declare it scarcity and then create hype around selling it, but it's not gamified. It doesn't generate data. It doesn't create a relationship with the end user. You have to have a network aware digital object that can actually do all sorts of fun, interesting things. So that's another piece that it's not an adjunct. It's not like, oh, there's a company that does that. It has to work with that wallet. And then that wallet has to seamlessly integrate into real world events and into virtual spaces. So that means you need a virtual space, but not one that, that it, again, it's this analogy of the real world. If I went to Dodger Stadium and they said, trust us, there's 50,000 people here, but there's only 100 like if your friend isn't in the hundred that, that, you, that we've identified you coming in with, you're not gonna be able to find them. I would be like, well, how do I know there's really, like that doesn't make sense. There, I, the, the whole point of feeling like you're somewhere is that there's people all around you. All these metaverse applications that shard at like 50 or a hundred people, that's not, that doesn't bring the psychology of the real world together with the physical world. You have to shard at tens of thousands or infinite, right? So then you need that and the simplicity of entering. I didn't, I'm a huge fan of Unity and of Unreal. I think they're absolutely spectacular what they bring. <clears throat> However, I think that they're augmentations to the internet. They're not open standards. They're proprietary stacks of code. And they do an amazing, beautiful job for certain uh, audiences. It was similar to how Flash worked in the early internet. But what you want is you want something open at first. You want the website to get better. And you want that to be uh, based on open standards and that just as the web, anyone can build whatever they're gonna build, very easy for anyone to build their manifestation, their creativity on it. And then for folks who have a certain type of machine or want to add proprietary technologies, you can add, go into this room, go into that, and you can add all sorts of things. So we needed to build a web-based metaverse that was massively scalable and dead simple to use as simple as clicking on cars.com and then you run into your mom and you talk about her and then you can interact with the cars and then you can pick something up and it'll be <clears throat> in your wallet. But that wallet wasn't something that you needed any technical skill to do. The metaverse needed no technical skill any more than going to CNN.com or to realvision.com. All of these elements, easy, simple, massively scalable and seamlessly integrated seem very simple now that they're together and working at scale, but they weren't simple to do. And that's what took us the time and energy. The experiences you've built are quite extraordinary. Things like spatial awareness, which I think is really interesting. So we can all go to a concert together, watch somebody on a screen in Vatim, but I can sidle over to you and say, and have a side conversation. And you've made it so it feels real. Yes. Right, because that was one of the problems is you have a Zoom call and everybody's talking at each other and you can't create that human connection. But you've got that super interesting. You've got obviously the integration of of video, your avatar approach, I thought was very interesting, as opposed to going the PFP route, which most people have been using. You said, well, everybody now uses video. So sure, if you want to use a PFP, use a PFP. But why not just use your video so I know it's you and you know it's me? So it feels that one stage closer to something we know. It's a bit more skeuomorphic in yeah. its approach. Right. Then when I looked at what you've done with the wallet and that experience, it's basically a drag and drop chain agnostic wallet. So you could take a, an augmented reality NFT or whatever it is, mm. object, and just drag it into your wallet and then it's yours. That's right. Which doesn't exist elsewhere, right? MetaMask, and I was buying something yesterday, it's a fucking nightmare to use. Exactly. Um, and you've, you've changed all of that. Yes. Um, and that's just scratching at the surface. And we'll talk about some of the brands and what people have been doing. What I want to understand is 
the interoperability of what you've built. Yes. So can I, let's say I'm in Vatim mm. and I want to also give, sell you my, some other NFT that I've got. Yes. Is it in, interoperable or does it have to be a Vatim object? Uh, it's absolutely interoperable. And the core of the premise is interoperability. Remember, we're coming from a philosophy of 30 years of being part of evolving the web. And if it, if, if you, and of the marvel of seeing a uh, uh, mosaic turn to Netscape, turn to modern day browsers, and to see this uh, phenomenon grow, not with that as an adjunct uh, cool factor, but because of that, right? It's because of the interoperability that the web exists. If you went to CNN.com and then you went to a link to something interesting and it was like, well, wait a minute, do you have the right browser? Do you have the right computer? Do you have the, are you using TCP IP versus MS TCP? Like all these elements have to be standardized and available and seamless to the end user. In other words, the, the complexity needs to be abstracted to the point where to the extent that there's incompatibilities, they're not noticed by the user. So our premise from the start was to create a um, identity system that you can move from place to place. Everything is identity, right? But the objects themselves, uh, we can't control what, what um, blockchain somebody's gonna put them on. What we can control is whether it matters, right? So we abstract at the level of minting, so you can mint on any blockchain, and at the level of display. So your wallet, uh, from the perspective of the end user, might have one thing on Solana, one thing on Palm.io, one thing on EOS, one thing on uh, ETH mainnet or, or Polygon. And from the end user, they don't know. And the reason why that's so important to go mainstream is not only its simplicity and elegance, that's important, but from a business perspective, you can't choose a blockchain and then expect that your choice may still be the same in the future. The best blockchain might be the one that's not invented yet. And certainly this is early, right? And so you say, okay, come to my concert. iHeart is one of the companies that we work with and has been a pioneer in this space. Amazing people there that are really innovating. Uh, but imagine that they had to go to their constituents and say, okay, now you're coming to the next concert and the objects you had last time were on this blockchain or, or on, you know, such and such compatibility. Just bring your 17 wallets and it'll be awesome. No issue. People are like, I like Taylor Swift. I don't care about this. Like that's not, you know, so you have to completely eliminate that at every level and make it so simple and fun that everyone wants to do it. And it's real. And it's not even realizing that they're using these technologies. Everyone already knows how to scan a QR code to get a menu. Thank you, COVID. Um, and everyone has a phone. So you can scan something, things can fall on your lap, and then you can start to interact. Now, the key difference between Web 2 and what you might call Web 3 with these technologies is when you do interact with these objects, the objects might be coming from different creators. So instead of having 97 apps and using four and not knowing where you got what and how you're going to bring up the right thing at the right time, People are going to generally start to gravitate towards wallets that aggregate their objects, aggregate their ownership. But they, ha they, they have to come from different brands and different creators, different artists, right? So in one place, you have to have those. Under the hood, this is where this complexity mask needs to come in. You now need to manage data very carefully and with a high degree of integrity and compliance with the rules in whatever region you are in the world. Some... Uh, Data sovereignty rules means you can't move data out of certain regions. Some say, if I've given permission to this brand to communicate with me, let's say it's Samsung, doesn't mean I've given permission to Taylor Swift to, to drop me something and communicate. So you have to know what permissions and what type of data sharing this individual has enabled and then help them communicate with the brands and the objects and the uh, experiences that they want to. That's what the wallet does. It's that underlying machinery that is transparent to the user. But I could use that wallet for my other assets that I exactly. didn't have on Vatum. I can I, I can yeah. keep my ETH in it, so I can buy something from you. I can meet you right. in Vatum. You want to sell me a digital good? I can pay you an ETH there and then, and yeah. we just kind of exchange yes. easily. And, and I might run into you, and you might have a uh, an object, not nothing to do with Vatum, an NFT that is uh, completely created on a, on something that uh, is not our system and i may want to buy it from you um or you may want to give it to me uh which is, i think is more frequently going to be the case with brands and ways of wanting to engage um 
let's say it's a brochure on the table. Let's say I only have a minute to talk to you, but I want to get more information later. I could just pick one up. And now that becomes a conduit of communication between us. But I don't care what the underlying technology is. I care what the content is and what the interaction between us as humans is. It's decentralized in what ways? What happens, you know, because there's the fear of what Meta are doing. And, you know, you're actually playing in a lot of the same areas Meta are, but you've got to market much faster in, in what you've done. The fear about Meta is that it's a corporate metaverse and they own it. Mm. And therefore, they can suddenly extract rent in ways that only the Web2 players have done. Like, you know, how, how, how do you deal with that kind of issue? Well, it's an important balance. You want to make sure that people understand that you're building something open, right? Our, um, our open source work is critical to our philosophy. Uh, we increasingly are interested in putting more and more into open source so people can build whatever they want. Um, and also our free tier. Like, it's not only open source. We actually want to put things in that, that it's not just, you know, you're on your own. Good luck. We actually want to provide uh, service and capability to people who, who don't need to pay. Um, that said, once you start to get into advanced use cases and volume, it's the same as the web. Like you can go and you can make some HTML, right? And you can go and you can make a free website. Is it really free? Not really, because you need a server. So you can rent one or buy the drink on Amazon, AWS, or on Azure, or on Google Cloud, uh, or you can get a server, you can connect it to the internet. There's no really free lunch. You're still buying something to connect to the internet. You're still buying some hardware. You're getting some software, but you can do whatever you want, right? It's your website. Um, we're trying to, trying to model that same concept. It's not that you're buying land in our metaverse, like and setting up in meta or setting up in Decentraland or setting up in Sandbox. That's th those are great, and I'm sure that they'll thrive in their own niche ways. To me, I, they feel like games. They don't feel like an evolution of the web itself. We're looking to be part of something that isn't just about us. We're looking to contribute to something that is about a bigger picture of hundreds of thousands of developers and people and scientists and, and companies that are trying to make the web more effective for them. So we're putting this stuff not only into open source, but into forms that can be experimented on and developed upon. So this is, this is a really important point, Ro, because when you look at uh, who we're trying to appeal to, we want to appeal to folks who don't know how to code and can drag and drop and do things super quickly. Like you can make a metaverse with a wallet, with an NFTs, literally in minutes. But the real innovation is going to come from people who are either smarter than us and or more knowledgeable than us in their own use cases, who are going to augment the system and build better and better capabilities. And the way we see that is they can build those capabilities as plugins to the fundamental architecture, not as just for their app, but as a change to what it is we're doing, like a plugin. Most of the work we do are just plugins to the base, right? So anyone can build these plugins. And then what they can do with them is they can give them away, they can contribute them back to the community, or they can sell them. Peter Diamantes, who's a dear friend and a uh, investor and board member of uh, Vatom, has a notion called the interface moment. He's put forward this concept, which I find quite brilliant. If you look at history of technologies developing, you find these moments where the niche group of scientists or early adopters suddenly explodes and it becomes part of daily life. Well, what is that moment? Why, why does that happen? What he's identified is that there's an interface moment which has to do with, one, the simplicity of being able to adopt the technologies, the, the user interface, but also the developer uh, capabilities where someone can make money from creating new capabilities. So the App Store was one of those moments where suddenly it's like, oh, I can make money making something and people could easily consume it. And that just became a massive flywheel of success, right? This happens over and over and over again for technologies. We think we're part of that interface moment for what you might call Web3 or Metaverse. But with the App Store, the issue is with the App Store is you you kind of very much beholden to Apple. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, they are the beer moth of which you need to abide by their rules or you get booted out. Yeah. But that's not what you're doing here. No. So when you have an open system like ours, 
Um, this is a, I've created open source companies before, and this is now fairly well trodden territory. You can, you, you need to create a business model to sustain yourself. Like this is not all, it's not all effective altruism, like our friends uh, at FTX. <laughs> we don't use those words. <laughs> no, uh, this is, this is the, the opportunity to contribute to something important, but we actually do want to create and feel we can create a very substantial business. So what you want to do is you want to open it up so that people can compete with you, right? So one, you can create anything you want, and that plugin is for you. You don't have to bring it back to the community. You don't have to pay us a dime to distribute it to your constituents. You can do, you, it's your plugin, right? Um, you can make it free. You can make it free just for your uh, company, right? We have roles and responsibilities ar around uh, security. Um, you can also create an app store that is not our app store. So you can make an app store and you can charge 90% and see if it's so good that someone wants to pay you or 1%. Or you can use some of the, the um, I would say, the commercial distro activities that we put forward because we are trying to take this underlying open system and we're trying to create, uh, I would say, value that is worth some dollars that at scale will create a very substantial business as well. So just so people understand, right, decentralized, decentralized, I think the latest thing came out, there's like 16 people a day going there, right? How many people have used Vatim? Wow. So the, there's so many people that have used it because our definition of metaverse is very different than Decentraland. So remember, remember at the beginning of our chat here, we said that our goal isn't necessarily to count the number of avatars running around in virtual worlds. Our goal is to count the number of people that are engaging with these, with these objects and have wallets and are interacting with them daily. And the way that they're getting these wallets is because every company in the world, the same way that they built a website, they're now going to build a better website. And what's a better website? It's the same as the website you have, adding people, places, and things. You need a wallet. You need smart NFTs. You need a way to interact with them across AR and VR. So it's the, it's the, the acceleration of this. Let me give you a few examples. So we have tens of millions of these objects out there and millions of these wallets, but it's growing like mad. But the reason is... You've got tens of millions of objects of NFTs, essentially. So, yeah, in 2017, we also um, licensed some of the code to have an open source object model called Block V. And there's been an ecosystem of companies building on top of that. And Block V has advanced itself over the years. And so we have people using the open source versions. We have people using our uh, commercial distro versions. And it's out there all over the place with various companies building uh, you know, really interesting projects on top of it. I think where, where we've really focused on the commercial distro aspect of it is the seamless integration of all the pieces. So you might be a brilliant inventor and you want to take some of that code and you want to say, OK, I want to do something for a niche in advertising. Or I want to do something in healthcare or something in, 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 in education. And you can take that code and you can start to maneuver it in various ways. But it's complex to do. And there are various companies that might support you, you know, SIs or, or different versions of, of um, commercial, commercialization on top of it. What we've looked to do is to create a seamless interaction across all of them and then deliver it out where it's super simple to get the results you want. Now, the results that most people want are about creating long-term relationships with their constituents, whether those are employees or consumers. Let me give you an example. Um, PepsiCo, uh, one of the largest, I think actually PepsiCo and Frito-Lay, its subsidiary, is the largest food and beverage company in North America, um, possibly in the world. I don't know how, how they fare in the ranks, but they're quite substantial. And what they did is... Nothing short of remarkable, and the, 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 the stats are, are phenomenal. So they built on the Vatim platform a uh, capability to scan a snack. Um, hundreds of millions of bags of Lay's potato chips, Doritos, uh, Cheetos, all these delicious morsels. You go into a 7-Eleven, take a, a, uh, a, um, a scan with your phone, and you're, you're entered into a contest to get tickets to the World Cup and draws you in to a request to take a selfie and share it with somebody. It mints you an NFT of yourself 
as a hexagon, a golden hexagon, that as you share it, becomes part of a communal art project where everybody around the world is getting these, these, uh, these selfies that are minted put together on a single golden football in the sky. It really unites you in a very emotionally impactful way with everyone. Then you have this golden ball spinning that you can spin with your finger and then pinch into. And as you pinch into it, you see these faces from all over the place coming together on a permanent artifact. So let's talk about decentralization. <clears throat> this is not an artifact in a game. This is an artifact that will stand the test of time, that will be passed down through generations as an independently observable and authenticated singular use of a piece of art, right? It is, it's a one of one for each individual that gets it. And there'll only be so many minted for those who played, who, who participated. But now you're part of history simply by scanning a bag of chips. That to me was one of the more brilliant use cases I've seen for decentralization in Web3 because it connected people. But it's actually much more interesting than it even appears on the surface. On the surface, it's like, okay, Finally, an interesting use for engagement and use, uh, use cases for Web3. But now imagine what's happened. Every single individual who's decided to participate and get the value from this experience has opted in on an ethical and legal data relationship back with Frito-Lay to say, thank you for giving me this. What else you got for me? So now there's a direct relationship between the brand and the consumer that is mutually beneficial to continue for long-term uh, uh, communication. That's advertising, marketing, and loyalty collapsed into one, into the next generation of human engagement. That's the metaverse to me. So when you say Decentraland has a couple thousand people, how many do you have? I say, that's not our metaverse. So that's, that's a different game. That is a game. We're playing a, a role, we believe, in advancing the communication system that the internet brought to us to make it more powerful and lasting. Yeah. But and what I'm trying to get to is you've done some massive activations for massive brands, right? In a way that nobody else has done. People don't even know what you're doing. Mm. And so we're talking about Decentraland because it's really not being used. But you've got scale happening yeah. in a defined use case, which is actually this, this kind of business version. And that's a bad word for it. But it's a it's a it, it, it's something that brands and corporations and pop stars or whoever they want can use this whole suite of experiences you've built, adapt it, create it. And some of these are huge. So talk about if you're able to some of the brands who've been using it sure. and how big they are, because you've had a bunch of you know, large numbers of people come to these things. Yeah. And again, nobody's aware of this stuff, right? Uh -huh. Nobody's aware of it. Well, they might not be aware of us yet, but there are a lot of people are aware of the artifacts of our work because they're out there, right? That's right. We're because not because you've there. abstracted it away, people don't. That's and right. Particularly in the, in the Web3 space, they're not as aware. Exactly. Uh, but they're getting increasingly aware because I think what's happening is that our forecast is coming true. Um, not, not to, not, I don't want any, what's that word in the German chart, for it or whatever it is when you're happy that things have collapsed. In the, I, we're not, I don't want to cl claim any of that or give off that feeling, but we did predict that the evolution of this, uh, of, of the application of this technology would start with rampant speculation and get rich quick schemes and would soon settle down into substantive capabilities to enhance the value of the web the same way the early web did, right? Dot com this, dot com that, valuations like mad and suddenly collapsed. And everyone said, oh, the web's not interesting. Pets.com didn't work. Well, maybe Petstop didn't work for a certain reason at the time, but I bet it'll work now. And it'll work because of lessons learned and because of sober application of the technologies to real world business outcomes. That's what's happening here, right? So uh, to answer your question, uh, you can look at multiple campaigns that have run out with some of the largest brands in the world that are, and are, are happening every day. You can look at the Volvoverse, the first electric vehicle uh, that was ever launched in Metaverse, was done by a division of uh, WPP called Yonder. Brilliant people in South Africa who built on the platform. A lot of what I'm about to say, what I'm most proud of of what they're doing is that we didn't do it. <laughs> is that the creativity and the technology that was applied um, was a merger of our underlying platform and their expertise. Uh, that's the beauty of what we can do to scale now. So look at what they did for Volvo. Look at what 
Procter & Gamble, the world's largest advertiser, this is something really interesting. The world's largest advertiser by volume has a group, and I'm, I'm going to get the name wrong, but it's something like the, the, the next, the, the post-advertising world, or like what's next after advertising, right? Because they recognize that traditional advertising is not nearly as effective as it was. And that the, the next generation of this has to be in alliance with the consumer to give them value for their time and to make them feel worthy of having spent that time on this interaction. Secondly, Apple um, made a huge impact on the business by cutting off cookies in the way that they were being used to kind of surreptitiously gather data and target people. So people are now needing more effective ways anyway to communicate with people. So if you look at Procter & Gamble's multiple campaigns and where we hope to go next with them, they're actually starting to uh, look at gathering first party data in ethical and legal manner to create gamified experiences that engage people in such a way that they want more and they're re requesting more. What happens when people request more, they move from what's called first party data to zero party data, meaning that they're not just uh, uh, kind of giving up a little bit of information about themselves so that they can play and get back into their wallet. They're actively saying, let me tell you about myself so I can get more value. Let me tell you that I love basketball and I'm interested in this type of music because the experiences that you're giving are worth it to me to get the value that's more applicable, more personalized to me. Uh, other things are like State Farm. See what they did for Super Bowl was astounding. They dropped. So you, I, I don't know this for a fact, but you don't get less technical consumers generally than people uh, you know, that were trying to reach uh, for State Farm. They're not, they're, they're not known as focused on technology. So now imagine that suddenly there's a million plus digital footballs and augmented reality scattered all over the United States and state farm cons uh, customers are going and catching them and getting them and they're turning into NFTs and they're engaging in these gamified models where the, the metrics of what you get for satisfaction around how long did they play or dwell time and, and, and how many shared with others is just off the charts compared to traditional mechanisms. But even more importantly, they now have a direct conduit, a direct ongoing communication channel with those consumers where they don't have to ask a retailer for permission to talk to their own consumer or Mark Zuckerberg, please give us permission to talk to our own consumer. The consumer has said, let's talk, let's have a relationship. <clears throat> the essence of any human relationship is about uh, proving your value every day, even if you're just a good listener, even if you're providing something uh, funny, interesting, some reason to spend time with one another as humans, that's what sustains a relationship and builds it over time and, and creates trust. Same thing happens between brands and consumers. And this is the most powerful human communication tool since the introduction of the internet. So these are the types of things we're seeing. Now you can also move to the B2B side. What we saw with Intel, for instance, was also quite astounding. Intel had I would say, I think it was something like 700 um, executives come from all over the world into a single URL. And they had scientists within the URL, people, places, and things, remember, showing up, showing their PowerPoints, showing their videos, talking about their breakthrough innovations with extremely technical things. And then people were able to run into each other, right? This is a big part of the next generation of the internet is humans catching up with one another, spontaneously finding someone that you didn't expect to meet, that you couldn't do on a Zoom, and then going in. And when you're in an environment like that, where you can have sound attenuation, where you're just hearing the people around you, you brought this up earlier. This is the kind of thing that was pioneered by uh, Philip Rosedale back in the day with Second Life and then with High Fidelity and became our partner. Uh, you have the ability to now focus the attention around conversation and relationship building and more simulate real life. And then if you want to pick up a brochure off the table and follow up later, that's an NFT, a network aware, dynamic digital object that now creates a communication channel between the creator and the user. That, I think, when all these things become seamless and completely transparent to the end user, that's where the internet is going. And we're seeing it now at scale. Yeah, because what you're doing is changing the game on marketing, getting rid of the middlemen in the middle allowing brands to connect directly with the people. You're creating, obviously there's new products and services they can offer because you're in a different space, a different type of experience. 
events. So Intel are getting together all their senior management team without all of the cost. But it's still pretty interactive because you can go and meet Joe and have a quick chat with him. And you could be even having a glass of wine yeah. at home while speaking to Joe. And you've got that experience. So you've got this real world feeling. And it's helping initially what you've had the big breakthrough with is these massive corporate brands who are realizing, okay, this is the future of where the internet lies. This is the future of websites. But because it's open source as well, anybody can build anything on it. So right. who knows what's going to be built on it, whether it's somebody building concert experiences or whether it's somebody building meeting rooms or the new version of Discord or whatever yeah. it is. I mean, we're looking at it for real vision to say, what, yeah. okay, what could we do here? Yeah. So if I was to distill it down, because there's so many parts, is what you've built is the platform. It's the platform. It's the open source platform for a Web3 metaverse world. And That's right. And it's going to take the vertical expertise of systems integrators and agencies and partners of all types to then apply that the same way that you have uh, uh, the web and say, OK, what does it cost to make a website? What is it good for? Well, it depends what you want to do with it, right? The one thing that I think we've broken through on now through compliance with the, the data rules, with the integration of the various pieces seamlessly, is we've now proven out that there's a infinite number, there's a white space, a, a new canvas for imagination, where you can now build things that are demonstrably and measurably better than the existing tools. What we're talking about, what Comic-Con Metaverse is doing, what Intel did, what GoDaddy is doing, all these different companies, it, you can't do it with Zoom. You can't do it with Teams. You can't do it with a website. You can't do it with just a wallet. You can't do it with an NFT drop. You can't do it with a Metaverse where you're running around. You can only do it with these, the, the, this convergence of these exponential technologies into a single platform. We won't be the only one. But we are part, I think, of a group that is leading the way. And uh, we're now finding more and more organizations and companies not only augmenting what we're doing, but building on top of it. And that's really gratifying. Look, it's super interesting. I just want to follow this journey as they go, because I think people can be very interested in what you're doing. I think people at first will think, well, this is not the kind of kind of degen nft ninja thing until they realize this is the future of how all kind of marketing activity brand activity online meeting engagement this is also what meta saw this is what mark zuckerberg saw yeah that he's pivoted the entire business around it now yeah and the issue is is we don't know how closed they're going to be because they've never been open source they're not you know they, they don't do it but you know, you've got that trust element that's available because you have interoperability and you have the ability for people to build they, what they want. I think it's super exciting what you're doing, and you. uh, I just can't wait to see where it goes. <laughs> Thank you. It's it, it's going to go in so many directions because we already see people building things so much more interesting than we could do ourselves. It's really exploding, and the moment is now to learn and then take that learning back into a virtuous cycle of making the platform better and better. Fantastic. Well, I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you, Ro. It was a wonderful time to spend with you today, and I really appreciate being on your show. So what did I learn from this conversation with Eric? I've learned that the metaverse is much closer than we think. It's like that conversation I had with Emad Mostak, where suddenly you have to recalibrate your understanding. You know, we're hearing about Meta building out their stuff and we're seeing the kind of clun clunky experiences in Sandbox and Decentraland. And we're seeing on Cyber, if you remember, we spoke to Ryan about what he's building there. And here is something similar. It's a browser rendered um, Metaverse experience. But here is incredible integration of multi-chain wallets, drag and drop functionality for NFTs, digital objects, AR, VR integration, spatial audio awareness, um, and all sorts of other features. It really shocked me how fast this is coming and that it's already being used. This is not something we're talking about, like with Facebook um, and their projects. This is something that's happening right now. 
And I can only imagine that as more brands learn about this, the more people are going to be doing it. Now, you may think of this and say, well, isn't this just a corporate experience? Well, we're all customers of corporations. And what he's doing here is onboarding millions into the metaverse and into Web3. There's no reason the same functionality can't be used for maybe music festivals or other types of festivals. There's no reason why Real Vision couldn't use Vatim for some of our metaverse experiences. Is this a better way of doing Discord where we can get groups of people together? You can see each other via this, the, the video avatar and you can talk and move around and have different experiences. I think there's a lot here and it's something really worth keeping your eye on. Hey, visionaries. Thank you for tuning in. For more free crypto content like this, head over to Real Vision dot com forward slash crypto you'll get early access to the most brilliant minds in the space to cut through the noise get in-depth analysis and get you ahead of the curve with unbiased insights